Here we go. Let's talk about the introduction to enzymes. Why are we going to talk about enzymes? Here's the, here's the bottom line up front. This is why we're doing this. Enzymes are the builders and the breakers in the body. You need to build a new molecule, it's an enzyme doing it. You need to break down a molecule, it's an enzyme doing it. And again, in terms of relevancy to health and healthcare professions, the majority of pharmaceutical drugs are small molecules that bind to either activate an enzyme or inhibit an enzyme. So it's really important that we know how enzymes work. And that's predominantly what we're going to be talking about this whole unit. Just a quick example, um, this diagram here is showing the life cycle of HIV where you have the virus here, it binds the host cell, it releases its viral RNA, transcribes it into DNA, uh, gets the, the host cell to make proteins out of it, and then has to cleave those proteins to get a functional new virus to form. So there's a couple key enzymes in this process. One of them is the reverse transcriptase enzyme that synthesizes RNA into DNA, um, and another one is the protease, so that cuts the viral protein. So these three drugs that you see are up here are all enzyme inhibitors for different steps in this process. So just an example, here are several drugs for HIV that are based on enzyme inhibition, but there are many, many more examples in medicine. Enzymes catalyze reactions. So you know a catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction without getting involved itself. So the idea is that this enzyme is going to speed up a chemical reaction in the body. So here are some examples of different enzymes and how quickly they work. Um, well, how quickly that reaction happens without an enzyme, right? This is the uncatalyzed rate compared to how quickly it happens with the enzymes. So this would be 39 times per second. So this is a rate enhancement. If you take those two numbers, divide by each other, 1.4 times 10 to the 17 times faster when there's an enzyme present. So you can look at a lot of these different examples and get the idea that enzymes speed up reactions a lot. All right, if we're going to talk about enzymes, we need some vocabulary. So if I say the substrate, I'm talking about the reactant in an enzyme reaction. So the substrate binds to the enzyme, and then it's going to go through some chemical reaction and then be released as a product. But when we're talking about enzymes, we call the reactant a substrate instead. Many enzyme names have the suffix ace. So for example, decarboxylase, nuclease, nucleosidase, peptidase, isomerase, mutase, anhydrase, they all end in ace, which tells you that they are an enzyme. Some enzyme names describe what they do, or what they bind to. So for example, citrate synthesase is an enzyme that makes citrate. Lactate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that removes hydrogen from lactate. Some enzyme names only describe what they bind to. So for example, glucose 6-phosphatase just describes the substrate it's binding to. Some enzymes are just a word, like trypsin. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the function of the enzyme. This word trypsin was named from the ancient Greek word for rubbing, since it was first isolated by rubbing the pancreas with glycerin. Kind of random. You couldn't guess that from the name trypsin. So that's one of those you just have to know that word and then know what that enzyme does. And then one more vocab word here. So the active site is where the enzyme binds its substrate. So it's only going to be a small part of the whole enzyme, a small volume, um, and that's where the substrate is going to bind. But we've got more vocabulary. Okay, so if we talk about the cofactor, a cofactor is a small molecule that some enzymes require for activity. And if it's an especially tightly bound cofactor, we're going to call it a prosthetic group. Essentially, if it's a prosthetic group, it doesn't unbind. Um, there are two main classes of cofactors. One is a coenzyme, which is an organic molecule derived from a vitamin, um, like derived from vitamin B12, that's a common one. And then the other class are metals. So either of these, they're both cofactors, and either of them can be prosthetic groups if they're very tightly bound. And then an enzyme with a cofactor bound is called a holoenzyme. And then without the cofactor, that enzyme is called an apoenzyme. So here's that information in the diagram. Here is our enzyme. Uh, this is the active site where the substrate is going to bind. Um, but this enzyme needs a coenzyme, specifically a cofactor, to function. So here, without that, that's called the apoenzyme, which is inactive. Once it binds its cofactor, now we have the holoenzyme, or the activated form. And now the enzyme can bind its substrate and do its catalysis. So here's some examples of different enzyme cofactors. So for example, the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase has a cofactor that is also a coenzyme, right? So you're thinking a small organic molecule, thiamine pyrophosphate. Uh, another common one, FAD, another common one, NAD+. So these are examples of small organic molecules, biotin, maybe you recognize more directly as a vitamin, and the enzymes that need to bind to those in order to do their function. Here's a list of other enzymes that need a metal cofactor to be able to do their job. So you'll notice most of the time we're looking at metal ions, but not, not all of the time. So all of these things are cofactors. The ones up top are coenzymes, and the ones down on the bottom are metals. 
Why does biology use enzymes to get work done? So the main reason is that enzyme action is very specific and controllable. Well, and it speeds things up. But not only that, enzymes are very specific, meaning that they do their intended role without making side products. If you ever meet an organic chemist who's doing research, maybe they're trying to synthesize a new chemical in the lab using a new reaction, they always have to talk about their percent yield. Like they got 70% the intended product and their 30, other 30% 30 was all junk that they weren't trying to make. So enzymes do not make any additional side product. You only get the intended product. Another thing about enzymes is they can be regulated. We talked about inhibitors or activators, right? Those are important for control of cell behavior. The cell needs to be able to turn an enzyme on and off depending on what it's doing. And then since this enzyme is a catalyst, that means it can be used over and over again uh, to catalyze a reaction. So again, you've got our enzyme, uh, it's gonna bind its substrates, make that enzyme substrate complex, and then you have this enzyme product complex after that chemical reaction has happened, and then the enzyme releases the product. So only the intended product was formed, and then here's our enzyme, it can be used over and over and over again to make more and more product. There's six major classes of enzymes. They're categorized by what type of chemical reaction they're catalyzing. I don't need you to memorize these, but I do want you to um, just recognize the words if you hear them. It will be, it'll help you out if you know what these mean when they come up later. So you've got our, we've got our oxidoreductases, which catalyze oxidation reduction reactions. Transferases, move functional groups between molecules. Hydrolases, cleave bonds and add water. Lyases, remove atoms to form double bonds, or they add atoms to double bonds. Isomerases move functional groups within a molecule, and ligases join two molecules, and they use ATP to get that done. So this will be useful when later on, especially in metabolism, when we're looking at a specific enzyme, um, you might see one of these roots in the enzyme name. So knowing these words will help make that easier later on. So reactions, chemical reactions in the body are typically going to require enzymes. Even something as simple as adding a molecule of water to carbon dioxide requires an enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, uh, which we, we talked about this reaction related to buffers and pH. So this would take too long on its own, so the body uses an enzyme to get this done quickly. So this is that carbonic anhydrase enzyme that is found in red blood cells. Another example, and this is a good one to know. So this is trypsin, what we talked about earlier, right? So trypsin is a proteolytic enzyme, meaning that it catalyzes the hydrolysis of peptide bonds. What does that mean? So here's our peptide bond. So this is going to be hydrolyzed, meaning that we've added water. We've broken that original bond, and we've added a water molecule, one oxygen here and two hydrogens here. So that's a hydrolysis reaction. And again, trypsin is the enzyme that catalyzes this. And trypsin is, a, um, is really specific, like all enzymes are, really specific. And in this sense, trypsin will only cut peptide bonds that follow a lysine or an arginine side chain. It won't cut the peptide bonds between other amino acids, only lysine or arginine. All right, so let's see if you can apply some of that vocabulary. In our example here, DNA polymerase catalyzes the reaction of free nucleotides into DNA. This reaction qu requires a magnesium ion to initiate catalysis. In this reaction, what is the enzyme, what is the substrate, the product, the cofactor, and the coenzyme? <laughs> 